of a brisk morning some days after the Reverend Chris Barkle soiree, two young men meet by chance in town. Mr. Landless, good day to you. And to you, Mr. Drood. A fine prospect. I beg your pardon? The cathedral, the castle. Yeah, I'm sure. Do you enjoy it for long? Up and down between here and town, then next year, well, a little up and down before I'm off to Egypt with... Mm. So you are not studying for anything? No more schoolboy stuff for me. Us engineers like to get our hands oily. Whilst you, I believe, are reading for the law exams at the Good Reverence. He is a decent man. Oh, and he told me of your other good fortune. Pray enlighten me. Your betrothal to Miss Bud. Which appears to be the talk of the marketplace. I apologize, but... If your good fortune... is hardly to be a topic of common chatter. I thought you would be proud of so... Well, I am a practical man, not a scholar like you, and it don't do in our world for a fellow to go around boasting of what he is most proud. It seems to me inconsiderate to talk so of someone whose circumstances you do not know. Best to keep it buttoned, Mr. Landless. Now, where I come from, sir, you would answer for that. Any time. <laughs> boys! Boys! We must have no more of this. These are high words, I hear. Ned, Mr. Neville is a stranger, and you should, nay, must, respect the laws of hospitality. Mr. Landless, you will pardon me, but I must say, govern your temper. There they stand, these three. A frozen moment. And best if they parted now and never saw each other the more. But Edwin takes a breath. So far as I'm concerned, Jack... There is no anger in me. Nor in me. I own that my history makes me touchy and, uh... Good. Now, please me again by taking a glass in friendship in my rooms. As the three leave, an omnibus deposits a passenger at the stop. An elderly gentleman with a lawyer's bag who makes his way to... Mr. Grugis to see Miss Bud. The Academy. Mr. Grugis looks like a lawyer, walks with the solemnity of a lawyer, and yet is still, heart, liver and lights, a decent man. My dear Miss Bud, my dear Rosa, I have kept you waiting. Will you forgive an old man? Always and forever, sir. Thank you for coming. How should I not? You were given into my care by your dear mother, as she... Miss Twinkleton pops in. Ah, ah, scissors. I do believe. Mr. Grugius, how pleasant to see you. Would well, you make yourself at... Do you care for... Uh, no tea. Thank you, Mum. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Sit down, sit down, do. <clears throat> First, if I may offer salutations upon your birthday, my dear young woman. <laughs> We bid careless girlhood farewell. Farewell indeed. But I find you well. You do, sir. Glad of it. Now, as you come to your last year at Miss Twinkleton's... Oh. Oh, Mum. Needle case. Oh, please don't disturb yourselves. Come and gone. At your service. And so to Mr Edwin, who has been to and fro here, as arranged... He has. And in your letters to me, you mentioned that you like him, and he likes you. I like him well enough, sir. Splendid. Uh... Yes? No, please to go on. And that upon reaching the age of 18, you will come into the lump sum of £1,700, as laid down in your father's will, from which the cost of your marriage may be at any time... May I ask you something, Mr. Grugis? Of course. So, my poor papa and Eddie's father were firm friends, and made an agreement that Eddie and I might be firm friends also. You put it admirably. For our lasting good and happiness? Exactly. But we are not bound by it. Our inheritance is not tied to that friendship, if you see what I mean. No forfeiture on either side, should there be no marriage. In short, this betrothal is a wish, a sentiment, a, a hope. Indeed, when you were children, both in my wardship, you grew accustomed to it, and it has prospered, as we see. As we see. Of your own free will and attachment, for your mutual happiness. Otherwise, null and void. 
Now, are there any instructions I may take from you for your affairs? I think I should like to settle things with Eddie first, if you have no... Uh, uh, no objection at all. <laughs> I am and always will be in this world, my dear Rosa, at your service. And fate, never loath to point out an infinity of choice for those of us resident upon this terraqueous globe, is yet at her work in John Jasper's chambers, pulling a thread here, laying in a pattern there. Ah, you recognize the picture of Miss Bud? I do, though it is far from flattering to the original. Oh, you're hard on it. It was done by Ned, who'd made me a present of it. <laughs> I'm sorry for that, Mr. Drood. If I had known I was in the artist's presence... Oh, so it was merely a sketch. To take a moment, a fleeting image. One day I will paint her, if she's a good girl. <laughs> oh, capital couch, Jack. Though the springs are going, I fear. Uh, that's because you lounge upon it so, Ned. Look at him, Mr. Neville. Thinks he's already the Sultan of Egypt. I dare say. Now, Landless, if you were to paint a picture of your lady love... I can't paint. Oh, I'm sure you would if you could. Would you make her Minerva, Juno, Venus? I have no lady love, Drood. Well, if I were to try my hand upon your sister, you would see what I can do. I'm sure very well. More sherry? But you'd need Helena's permission, and that you would never get. She's not one to waste her time lounging around being painted. I shall just have to bear the loss. I'm sure the loss would be mine. There he sits, all before him, a golden lad. Whereas you and I, Mr. Landless, are merely chimney sweepers, grinding away day by day. You make me feel quite guilty, Jack. It might have done Mr. Drood some good to have known some hardships. Oh, why? Yes, why? Because it might have made him more sensible that good fortune is not always due to his own merits. And have you? What? Known misfortune? I have. And what landless has it made you sensible of? Gentlemen. I told you this morning, unless you would prefer I keep it buttoned. <laughs> you said, I believe, that I would answer to you were we in that part of the world where you come from, yes? Yes. Fortunately, it is a long way away. Oh, here then, now, you damn braggart. Enough. Ned, stand down. Mr. Neville, you too. Stand down. I, I'll stand down. For now. Oh. That is a very angry young man. Hmm. Mr. Grugius has another commission before he returns to his offices in London. He awaits an appointment at the Traveller's Inn where he puts up when he visits Cloisterham. Ah, my dear boy. I'm sorry I'm late, sir. I was unavoidably detained. You seem a little high in colour, Edwin. I hope nothing is wrong. Oh, no matter, sir. A rude fellow, that is all. Then, I have booked a private room, and there we must talk together. I place this box before you. It contains a ring. A rose of diamonds and rubies set in gold. It belonged to Rosa's mother. It was removed from her dead hand in my presence. And see how bright the jewels are. A hundred times so were her eyes. It is almost cruel that the stones live on and she... It was removed by her grieving husband, who, when his time came so cruelly soon, passed it to me, that it be put upon Rosa's finger by her betrothed. And so I pass it to you, Edwin Drood. I charge you, bring past and present together. Sir, I... I will do as... You... But should you feel in the smallest part that you act under the charge of the past and not from your own heart, then bring that ring back to me. Do you understand? Yes, sir. I, I do. Night in the city. 
and a wanderer amongst the tombs of the ancient churchyard where Mr. Durdles, the cathedral stonemason, keeps an uneasy watch. Who goes there? I oh, say, who goes there? Come out, damn you. Of a ten pound club, Anne Maria. Uh, Mr. Turtles, uh, spare my skull, I might need it. Oh, Mr. Jasper, there you are. Solid as me and no ghost neither. You haven't forgot? You promised to show me the Undercroft and the Tower for my book. No, I can't say as I holds with books, but, um, <clears throat> is that a bottle you've got in your basket there? Prime port, Dirtles, and you does hold with that, I've no doubt. <clears throat> oh. oh, that's the right stuff. <laughs> ah, there's an itch to it, no. Right, shall we go? I'll have a lantern if you've the eyes to see. <clears throat> I'll take care at the bottom. Now, there's lime for mortar stalled. Don't you get none of it on you, mister, or it'll eat your skin away and you'll just be one more skeleton down here with the rest of them. Yeah, ever get lost down here, Dodd? Me? Oh, never. But I hear things. Howls and cries in the dark. Ghosts? Oh, ain't only what's been. There's ghosts, mister, now. Come along. It's a hike in the tower at the end of it. Ah, master of all your surveys from up here, eh? Ain't you, Mr. Jasper? A man who's not master of himself is master of nothing, Mr. Dudles. Oh, that going in your book. How about some more pork going in me, and then we're done? Is that a boy I see down there? <laughs> Ain't it just? <laughs> You're late! You're drunk! Your missus ain't gonna be pleased. Get along, you old. Oh, well, back off, deputy. I'm going. I'm a going. You now, you damned oh. baby devil. Who asked you, Mr. Whiskers? And yes. oh. you, boy, have been following us. Huh? Uh. Answer me. Now leave him be, Mister. He's only doing his job. Following me is not his job. Let me go. Let me go, mister. I wasn't following no one honest. No, I pays him to drive me home when I was late and drunk. It's true, Mr Whiskers. I throw stones to drive him home. I catch him out after ten. Witty witty why? Then I'll pick up a stone and shy. Then take him home. And boy, if you ever see me again, anywhere, anytime, any place, make sure I don't see you. Or by God, it'll be the last thing you ever see. <laughs> 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 